Does the book of Ruth teach that God is okay with interracial marriage? I've been getting this thing in the comments a lot and things, and, and I, I do speak against interracial marriage, not because I'm a racist. I don't hate anybody. I don't hate black people and, and whatever else. Um, if I hated black people, I would say, you know, let's uh, marry, have people of different, different races marry into them and, and breed them out, and eventually there won't be any black people anymore. Um, uh, you know, standing against interracial marriage doesn't mean that you hate other races or things like that. You keep them separate. Uh, it's kind of interesting because the first one that really said, let's bring everybody together, let's all be one, was Nimrod. And God came down and confounded their languages and said, spread out. Oh, but there's, there's only one race, the human race. <laughs> really? Uh, chapter and verse on that one? Uh, the first one that said that was uh, Nimrod. Hmm. Interesting. But I have a lot of people and they say, you know, oh, Brother Brian, you preach some really good sermons and I've been following you for a while, but, okay, Billy Goat believers, but, um, you know, they, uh, Billy Goat butts you, you know, if you didn't get that. But you shouldn't be wasting your time on interracial marriage. This is a controversial subject. It's not something that you should waste your time on. This is just wrong and blah, blah, blah. Uh, why would you go, why would you even bring this subject up? 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 1. Moreover, brethren, I would not that ye should be ignorant how that all our fathers were under the cloud and all passed through the sea and were all baptized unto Moses in the cloud and in the sea and did all eat the same spiritual meat, did all drink the same spiritual drink for, that, for they drank of that spiritual rock that followed them and that rock was Christ. But with many of them God was not well pleased for they were, our, for they were overthrown in the wilderness. Now these things were our examples to the intent we should not lust after evil things as they also lusted. Verse 7, neither be idolaters as were some of them, as it is written, the people rose or sat down to eat and drink and rose up to play. There's your idolatry. Verse 8, and this is the big one that got all people all upset and everything. Neither let us commit fornication as some of them committed and fell in one day three and twenty thousand. Why would he be talking about, you know, they say it's spiritual fornication. It's idolatry, in other words, spiritual fornication. No, it isn't. That's not what it's talking about in the context there because he covers idolatry in the previous verse. And you look back at that, there, you know, it's, it's basically when Moses is up in the mountain and he's up there and, and he gets the Ten Commandments from God and, you know, he comes back down and they're naked and they're worshiping this golden calf and the whole thing. Um, was there any fornication there? I have no idea. They were naked and dancing around and partying and things. Well, you would think that there'd be probably some fornication. Bible doesn't say. But the point is, that was idolatry. The next verse there where you have them taking uh, the Moabite women and, and the one guy takes a Midianitish woman and, and things. And, and I, you know, I posed the question and nobody really answered it. And that was, at least that I saw it and you know, didn't read all the comments because I just, you know, it was getting kind of old and whatever. But the, the question comes up, this guy in Numbers, Numbers chapter 25 he takes a Midianitish woman and he brings her before the congregation, before Moses, and he takes her into his tent. Now that is a marriage in the Old Testament. All right, that's not fornication. That is a marriage. That's what they did. Take him before the congregation. He actually takes him before Moses, takes her before Moses, excuse me, and then takes her into his tent. And Phineas goes in there and he kills them both. Well, the spear just runs them through. Why? Was it fornication? You see? It's called fornication. But, you know, I keep getting this thing thrown at me with, uh, well, book, the book of Ruth, the book of Ruth. So let's go back to the book of Ruth. We're going to go through the book of Ruth. Here, we're going to see what actually is happening here. If you want to use the book of Ruth to uh, promote interracial marriage, uh, you've got some real problems there. Some things that people just kind of conveniently overlook. But uh, again, you know, I don't, this, this whole thing of uh, this whole interracial marriage thing and oh, it's controversial and you should, the things that are written back in the Old Testament, you don't just say, I'm a dispensational Christian today and I'm just going to throw out the whole Old Testament and I'll throw out the Gospels and whatever. The whole Bible is there for, you know, um, doctrine, reproof, correction, instruction, and righteousness. That's written to a Christian for purposes of the Scriptures. And Paul plainly says about the things that are written before time are written for our learning. 
we're supposed to go back and read things in the Old Testament. But, you know, people say, Ruth was a Moabite, uh, Boaz was a Jew, it was an interracial marriage, obviously, God is for it, so we can do it today. Um, one other point I, I want to make here before we get into the actual book of Ruth and see what really happened there. Um, one other point I want to make is the fact that the Bible, if you can sum up what is the Bible, what is this book all about? Uh, the depravity of man and the perfection of Jesus Christ. If I was to sum up what the, the Bible is about. And so people go back through and they'll say, well, see, Moses married uh, this woman here and, and uh, Boaz, he married this Moabite woman here, Ruth, and God wrote a whole book about it. And, and so therefore, because other people did it, it's okay for us to do today. Um, no, the Bible has many instances of people failing God. And the Lord writes it down. He records it. But then when you actually see God judging certain things and, and giving them commands, don't go over there and take their daughters to be your, your wives. And He does that, and then they ignore that, and they say, well, so-and-so did it, and he got away with it, so it must be okay with God. It's a real problem. But let's look at what the book of Ruth actually teaches. Ruth chapter 1, we're going to read down to chapter, or chapter 1, verses 1 through 7. Now it came to pass in the days when the judges ruled that there was a famine in the land, and a certain man of Bethlehem, Judah, went to sojourn in the country of Moab, he and his wife and his two sons. Why not stay there in Israel like the rest of the Jews did? Why run away? Can't God provide? Hmm. Verse 2. And the name of the man was Elimelech, and the name of his wife Naomi, and the name of his two sons Malon and Chilion, Ephrathites, of Bethlehem, Judah, and they came into the country of Moab and continued there. And Elimelech, Naomi's, Naomi's husband, died, and she was left and her two sons. Why did he die? Because he was right with God? Or just natural causes, I assume, right? We'll see here in just a little bit what Naomi says. Not my opinion, not my interpretation, what Naomi says. Uh, verse 4, And they took them wives of the women of Moab, Notice that they did it after their dad died. Interesting. The name of the one was Orpah, and the name of the other, Ruth. And they dwelled there about ten years. And Malon and Chilion died also, both of them. And the woman was left of her two sons and her husband. I guess they died of natural causes too, right? We'll see. Verse 6. Then she arose with her daughters-in-law, that she might return from the country of Moab. For she had heard in the country of Moab how the Lord had visited his people in giving them bread. She didn't even go back until she heard that the famine's over. <laughs> Couldn't trust the Lord. Wherefore she went forth out of the place where she was and her two daughters-in-law with her, and they went on the way to return unto the land of Judah. You can read the whole book. We're not going to go through the whole thing. But, of course, they talk about, you know, Orpah goes back to her people. Ruth says, no, I'm going to stick with you, Naomi. And I'm not, and I'm not at all saying that Ruth was a bad woman in this study. Not at all. Uh, she was a good woman. All right. But the situation that, that arose out of that sin there of them going to Moab and, and the two sons taking Moabite wives, the problem that arose from it, we're going to see it in this book here, um, it's about inheritance. All right? I don't want to get ahead of myself. Ruth chapter 1, verse 19 through 22. So they, so they too went until they came to Bethlehem. And it came to pass when they were come to Bethlehem that all the city was moved about them. And they said, Is this Naomi? Didn't even recognize her anymore. And she said unto them, Call me not Naomi, call me Mara. For the Almighty hath dealt very bitterly with me. I went out full, and the Lord hath brought me home again empty. Why then call ye me Naomi, seeing the Lord hath testified against me, and the Almighty hath afflicted me? She's not saying, oh, God let, allowed me to go through some rough stuff. She's saying, God was against me. Look at that. Lord hath testified against me. Why? Because she left the land where she was supposed to stay. She left there. God set up boundaries according to the number of the children of Israel in Deuteronomy chapter 32. And she left. Her husband gets killed. Go home to Israel. It's a little sign from the Lord there. No, let's just stay here and 
I'll have my two sons marry daughters or you know, women from Moab against what the Bible says to do. And what's God do? Boom, kills both sons. Oh, I'm going to stay here a little bit longer till I hear that the famine's over. Then she goes back. The Lord's against her and what she did. Um, is God for interracial marriage? See, it's so funny because people will look at this and they'll say, well, Ruth married Boaz. Well, what about Ruth marrying Malon there and Chilion marrying Orpah? God killed him. And she says, the Lord is against me. So God's against the interracial marriage of, Chile, or of Malon and Ruth, but he somehow changes his mind with Boaz and Ruth. Malon and Ruth, wrong. Boaz and Ruth, correct and good. Oh, but maybe I guess they'll come out and they'll say that, uh, well, Naomi, the Lord was against her for another reason. It wasn't because of the interracial marriage of her son. Verse 22, so Naomi, so Naomi returned and Ruth the Moabitess, her daughter-in-law, with her, which returned out of the country of Moab, and they came to Bethlehem in the beginning of barley harvest. Why does it call her a Moabitess, by the way, if there's just one race, it's the human race? Why? Why make a distinction? You never know. Ruth chapter 2, verses 1 through 3. And Naomi had a kinsman of her husband's, a mighty man of wealth, of the family of Elimelech, and his name was Boaz. And Ruth the Moabite said unto Naomi, let, now, let me now go to the field, and glean ears of corn after him, in whose sight I shall find grace. And she said unto her, Go, my daughter. And she went and came and gleaned in the field after the reapers, and her hap was to light on a part of the field belonging unto Boaz, who was of the kindred of Elimelech. Now, let's just look at this and say, Oh, I think Ruth was you know, starting to fall in love with Boaz. And, oh, it was such a wonderful thing. No, it was called, they came there and they had no way to provide for themselves. And Ruth says, oh, do you have any relatives in this town? Oh, Boaz is his name? Okay, um, where's his field? Oh, that way. All right, uh, hopefully I can go and we can get some food so we can survive. She isn't going and saying, oh boy, he sure is. He's cute. Oh boy, I hope he's cute. I wonder if I can get a date. <laughs> no, she's saying, it's a very practical thing, you see coming into the country there, and she's saying, okay, I just left my home here. I have no husband to provide for me. What am I going to do? Well, do you have a relative, Naomi? His name's Boaz. Okay, let me go and, and harvest in his field there. Verse 4. And behold, Boaz came from Bethlehem and said unto the reapers, The Lord be with you. And they answered him, The Lord bless thee. Then said Boaz unto his servant that was over, set over the reapers, Whose damsel is this? Get back to that in a minute. And the servant that was set over the reapers answered and said, It is the Moabitish damsel that came back with Naomi out of the country of Moab. And she, and she said, I pray you, let me glean and gather after the reapers among the sheaves. So she came and hath continued even from the morning un, until now that she tarried a little in the house. Then said Boaz unto Ruth, Hearest thou not, my daughter? Go not to glean in another field, neither go from hence, but abide here fast by my maidens. Hmm. Get back to that in a minute. Let thine eyes be on the field that they do reap, and go thou after them. That Have I not charged the young men that they shall not touch thee? And when thou art athirst, go unto the vessels, and drink of that which the young men have drawn. Then she, shall, then she fell on her face, and bowed herself to the ground, and said unto him, Why have I found grace in thine eyes, that thou shouldest take knowledge of me, seeing I am a stranger? And Boaz answered and said unto her, It hath fully been showed me all that thou hast done unto thy mother-in-law since the death of thine husband, and how thou hast left thy father and thy mother and the land of thy nativity, and art come unto a people which thou knewest not heretofore. The Lord recompense thy work, and a full reward be given thee of the Lord God of Israel, under whose wings thou art come to trust. Then she said, Let me find favor in thy sight, my Lord, for that thou hast comforted me, and for that thou hast spoken friendly unto thine handmaid, though I be not like unto one of thine handmaids. Hmm. And Boaz said unto her, At meal time come thou hither, and eat of the bread, and dip thy morsel in the vinegar. And she sat beside the reapers, and he reached her parched corn, and she did eat, and was sufficed and left. Okay? Again, Ruth was a fine woman. Ruth was a godly woman. 
There's no questioning that. I'm not trying to, to, to destroy her character. But what I'm trying to say is, this isn't like interracial marriage of today. All right? And what, is, what does he do? Look there. At, uh, uh, where are we at here? Verse 8. Then said Boaz unto Ruth, Hearest thou not my daughter? Go not to glean in another field, neither go from hence, but abide here fast by my maidens. What is a maiden in the scripture? A maiden is a servant girl. Modern day English, a slave. Boaz tells this woman who's of, you know, technically somewhat Hamitic descent. You have a uh, lot going into Sodom and Gomorrah, which was the descendants of Ham went there. And he takes a wife and then his one daughter, you know, basically gets him drunk and, you know, sleeps with him in the, in the cave there after they leave Sodom and Gomorrah, after they, after they flee. And then their child becomes the ancestor of the Moabites. So I don't know what you would call that three quarter Jewish and one quarter Ham, you know, Hamite or whatever, because the mother and father, you know, mother, whatever the woman's name, Lot's wife, Lot, Jew, Hamite. And then they have one that's, you know, part Hamite, part Jewish. And then, you know, she is with her father. And so you have, there you have the Moabites. But he doesn't say to her, hey, uh, you know, hmm, I'm going to give you a real nice, respectable place. Hey, go over there with my, my female slaves, my maidens. Go over there and work with them. And she does. She doesn't say, well, the nerve. How you, I was interested in you, but now, buddy, you just pushed me a little bit too. No. Oh, okay, thank you. Oh, thank you so much. Why have I found grace and eyesight? You know, she was a good woman. Definitely a good woman. And again, what's the purpose of the book of Ruth? Well, it's to show some typology there for the future when Jesus Christ is symbolically marrying a Gentile bride, the bride of Christ. All right. Well, then it's okay for interracial marriage. It, it, people are crazy. People are crazy in the head. <laughs> you know, These, Jesus does things in type. He's not saying, oh, because I'm doing this in type, then you can do it there physically and whatever else, and it's just fine. Contradicting multiple scriptures. You know, again, why did God drop Elimelech and his two sons? And Naomi says, the Lord has afflicted me. He's against me. Why? But let's continue. Verse 19, chapter 2, verse 19 through 23. And her mother-in-law said unto her, Where hast thou gleaned today, and where wroughtest thou? Blessed be he that did take knowledge of thee. And she showed her mother-in-law with whom she had wrought, and said, The man, man's name with whom I wrought today is Boaz. And Naomi said unto her daughter-in-law, Blessed be the Lord, be, blessed be he of the Lord, who hath not left off his kindness to the living and to the dead. Hmm, here's where it gets interesting. And Naomi said unto her, The man is near of kin unto us, one of our next kinsmen. And Ruth the Moabite has said, He said unto me also, Thou shalt keep fast by my young men, until they have ended all my harvest. And Naomi said unto Ruth her daughter-in-law, It is good, my daughter, that thou go out with his maidens, that they may that they meet thee not in an, any other field. So she kept fast by the maidens of Boaz to glean unto the end of barley harvest and of wheat harvest and dwelt with her mother-in-law. It's good for you to be with his servant girls, his maidens. Hmm. Not, oh, it's demeaning. You shouldn't be there with those servants and things, you know. Chapter 3, verse 8. And it came to pass at midnight that the man was afraid, and turned himself, and behold, a woman lay at his feet. And he said, Who art thou? And she answered, I am Ruth, thine handmaid. Spread therefore thy skirt over thine handmaid, for thou art a near kinsman. And he said, Blessed be thou of the Lord, my daughter, for thou hast showed more kindness in the latter end than at the beginning, inasmuch as thou followest not young men, whether poor or rich. And now, my daughter, fear not, I will do to thee all that thou requirest, for all the city of my people doth know that thou art a virtuous woman." And she certainly was. She was a godly woman. And now it is true that I am thy near kinsman, howbeit there is a kinsman nearer than I. Hmm. Tarry this night, and it shall be in the morning, that if he will perform unto thee the part of a kinsman, well, let him do the kinsman's part. But he, if he will not do the part of a kinsman to thee, then will I do 
the part of a kinsman to thee, as the Lord liveth, lie down until the morning. Huh? Do the part of a kinsman? Yeah, you see, uh, if a family, line of families dies, and there's no male heir there, you say a father dies, I'll say it this way, and a no male heir there and, and things and whatever else, well, you're, the idea there in the Old Testament is that there needs to be a man there to carry on the inheritance, a near kinsman, in other words, to carry on there so that he can have that inheritance. Well, what are you going to do when God drops the father dead and the two sons dead? There's an inheritance there. There's a, you know, Elimelech's land, his holdings and things. Who gets it? See? That's what's going on here. Not uh, a loving thing of, of saying, you know, Boaz saying unto her, I love you, and I've loved you ever since I set eyes on you. It was love from the first sight. Nothing like that. Oh, you remember our first date? Remember the first time we kissed? And uh, No, uh, there's a guy who's in a better position to, to fulfill the part of a kinsman to you. And uh, I'm going to check with him first. And if he wants you, then okay. If not, I'll take you and do the part of a kinsman. But you can use this to justify modern day interracial marriage. Sure you can. Uh, let's continue here. Chapter 4. I'm going to read the whole chapter here. Then went Boaz up to the gate and sat him down there. And behold, the kinsman of whom Boaz spake came by, and whom he said, unto whom he said, Ho, such a one, turn aside, sit down here. And he turned aside and sat down. And he took ten men of the elders of the city and said, Sit ye down here. And they sat down. And he said unto the kinsman, Naomi, that is come again out of the country of Moab, selleth a parcel of land, whose was our brother Elimelech's. Real estate? Hmm. And I thought to advertise thee, saying, Be it, uh, Buy it before the inhabitants and before the elders of my people. If thou wilt redeem it, redeem it. But if thou wilt not redeem it, then tell me, that I may know, for there is none to redeem it beside thee, and I am after thee. And he said, I will redeem it. This near kinsman guy to Elimelech, he said, yeah, I'll, I'll take it. Verse 5, Then said Boaz, What day thou buyest the field of the hand of Naomi, thou must buy it also of Ruth the Moabitess, the wife of the dead, to raise up the name of the dead upon his inheritance. She's being counted as property? Hmm. You know, in other words, Boaz is saying, if you want the land, you got to also take Naomi, or uh, excuse me, Ruth, and raise up seed to her. Not, uh, I want the land because, and I love, I'm in love with Ruth. He didn't say that. And if this guy would have said, yeah, okay, then Boaz would have said, okay, hey, Ruth, here's your husband, go with him. Lord be with you. Hopefully you'll have some male heirs and things like that. <laughs> Verse 6, And the kinsman said, I cannot redeem it for myself, look at this, lest I mar mine own inheritance. Redeem thou my right to thyself, for I cannot redeem it. Mar his own inheritance? Do you think maybe he was saying, I don't want to marry a Moabite? Hmm. Verse 7, Now this was the matter in former time in Israel concerning redeeming and concerning ch changing. For to confirm all things, a man plucked off his shoe and gave it to his neighbor. And this was a testimony in Israel. Therefore the kinsman said unto Boaz, Buy it for thee. So he drew off his shoe. And Boaz said unto the elders and unto all the people, Ye are witnesses this day that I have bought all that was Elimelech's and all that was Chilion's and Malon's at, of the hand of Naomi. He bought it? Hmm. Again, look at the typology of Jesus Christ buying the church, his bride. Very interesting. And it's interesting too because the church is a bond servant. We're bought with a price. Hmm. Moreover, the Ruth, the Moabitess, the wife of Malon, have I purchased to be my wife. Purchased her? Really? And that's the same thing today as a modern day interracial marriage? 
to raise up the name of the dead upon his inheritance, that the name of the dead be not cut off from among his brethren, and from the gate of his place, ye are witnesses this day. And all the people that were in the gate and the elders said, We are witnesses. The Lord make the woman that is come into thine house like Rachel and like Leah, which too did build the house of Israel. And do thou worthily in Ephrata, and be famous in Bethlehem. And let thy house be like the house of Pharez, whom Tamar bare unto Judah, of the seed which the Lord shall give thee of this young woman. So Boaz took Ruth, and she was his wife. And when, when he went in unto her, the Lord gave her conception, and she bare a son. And the woman said unto the women said unto Naomi, Blessed be the Lord which hath not left thee this day without a kinsman, that his name may be famous in Israel, and he shall be unto thee a restorer of thy life, and a nourisher of thine old age, for thy daughter in law which loveth thee, which is better to thee than seven sons, hath borne him. And Naomi took the child and laid it in her bosom, and became nurse unto it. And the woman and the women her neighbors gave it a name, uh, saying, This is a son born to Naomi. And they called his name Obed. He is the father of Jesse, the father of David. Now these are the, be the generations of Pharez. Pharez begot Hezron, and Hezron begot Ram, and Ram begot Amminadab, and, Amin and Amminadab begot Nashon, and Nashon begot Salmon, and Salmon begot Boaz, and Boaz begot Obed, and Obed, Obed begot Jesse, and Jesse begot David. Okay? It's about inheritance. It's about Ruth being property. And Boaz saying, if I want Elimelech's land... I'm going to have to buy the land from Naomi and also raise up seed to the wife of the dead. And that's interracial marriage of today. Uh, a black man and a white woman or whatever getting together and getting married and whatever. How can you use this to justify that? But you see, if you're convinced of something that you want to do, you'll go through the scriptures and you'll twist things and contort things and do whatever you have to do to make a justification for what you want. So somebody wants to get interracially married, well, whatever, go ahead. Um, I'm glad I'm not. Uh, I'm going to tell you a little thing. I don't know if I've ever even said this before, but uh, I had numerous interracial relationships. Uh, and I don't mean fornication, but dating interracial, interracially, Spanish girls um, before I met my wife and you say well, oh you were involved in interracial relationships yeah you know why because I was a sex pervert that's why pornography addict and I lusted after the darker skin yeah and uh, I used to look at pornography websites and things like that interracial marriage was not the same category as reg regular uh, men and women together just to be very blunt about the whole thing there is a level of perversion in there, there. Oh, well, we're happily married and God's blessing us. And whatever. <laughs> um, for those of you out there who really truly love the Lord and love His Word and want to stand no matter what it costs you uh, and no matter how unpopular it makes you, I pray that uh, these videos have been a challenge to you and a challenge to take your stands uh, on the Word of God and not on modern politi politi politically correct speech. That's going to be it. Thank you for watching.